Hey everyone, for those watching at home, no, this is not the Minnesota's version of Santa Claus. It's Ron Johnson, and this is Ron Johnson's show. Yeah, I'm wearing the beanie. I'm excited. Gophers, Badgers, y'all had a lot to say last week, Badgers fans, and I can't really hear you right now. But on today's show, we got to talk about the Jets, Vikings. Vikings did something this past weekend that a lot of people did not expect. We'll get into that next on the Ron Johnson Show. Locked on Sports Minnesota Podcasts. It's endless Minnesota Vikings talk with the diverse voices of your local experts. Now the Ron Johnson Show. On the field, in the broadcast booth, Ron Johnson is Minnesota sports. He's played with them, hung out with them, and grown up with all the big names in Minnesota sports. They're hanging out with Ron Johnson. It's the Ron Johnson Show on the Locked On Sports Minnesota podcast. And it starts now. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Ron Johnson Show, and I'm your host, Ron Johnson. Like I said earlier, last week we talked about Patriots Vikings. Would the sky be falling if the Vikings were to lose to the Patriots? They have a tough Jets team coming in. We don't know who's going to play quarterback. Mike White, Zach Wilson. Mike White went out there and destroyed the Bears. But the Bears answered some questions as well because Justin Fields didn't play. So did Mike White get the best of the Bears? Or did he get a Bears team that truly now shows you need Justin Fields? Y'all were talking about, oh, I don't know if we need. You need Justin Fields. It showed on this past weekend when the Jets destroyed them with Mike White, not Zach Wilson, Mike White. And yes, that defense, really, really good. But that offense is not that good. So I don't understand what happened to the Bears. But this is not the Bears show. We're not talking about the Bears today. It's Jets week. But aside from that, we got to dig back into this Vikings-Patriots game and why everybody was so concerned. And the Vikings did something, as I said in the open. The Vikings did something that not a lot of people expected. And I'll talk about that. But before I do, you can now find Locked On Sports Minnesota on Amazon Fire and Roku. Just download the Locked On Sports Minnesota app to get all your favorite shows. And as I bring Sam Ekstrom in, my producer, Sam, this past weekend, Vikings, Patriots, uh, we talked about it all week. And everybody was trying to figure out who this Vikings team would be. Who, who, who would they be? Who are they? Who are you? That's the question that comes up in a lot of movies. Who are you? A lot of sports movies. Who are you as a team? Well, I think the Vikings answered some questions. A lot of questions. And Sam, I'll get your, your opinion first on this, but you were there. You, you and I both were there mm -hmm. at the game. Uh, atmosphere yep. was a little weird. There were a lot of Patriots fans in town for the holiday uh, or a lot of people that just love the Patriots and live in Minnesota. We know there's a lot of that because the Packers was the same way. But... What was your feeling in the stadium? Like, did it feel like this was a Vikings kind of blowout win? Did it just feel like this is going to be none of the one of those Vikings lose, people are pissed off? Like, what were your immediate thoughts after the game? Yeah, I thought the primetime atmosphere, just the significance of the holiday, I thought that crowd was juiced. Like, I thought they were ready to go. They were they were recovered from Sunday. I thought that uh, it was really, really cool the way that the stadium just produces things for night games. They've got the lights and they've got the, the flashes. Unbelievable scene. I loved the way it looked. I loved watching all the, the pregame pyrotechnics and theatrics. It was really, really cool. But how, how much wind does a um, opening drive touchdown put in your sails? I mean, the Vikings at that point, I think, were back. They said, okay, we're going to be fine. When they motor down the field, Justin Jefferson's throwing passes, he's catching touchdown passes, and the Vikings got that early lead. I thought that was huge for them. Um, so I think that gave them the confidence to go ahead sort of as normal and not let that Cowboys game linger after a 40-3 to blowout. I loved the energy, and Kirk Cousins said that the, uh, the third-string quarterback, David Blau, after the game, told him it was the loudest stadium he'd ever heard in his life, which is saying something. Um, although Blau did come from Detroit, so, so maybe it's not saying anything. But that's uh, – I, I thought it was a really cool atmosphere and an, a, a very impressive bounce back by the Vikings. Yeah, it's funny you bring up the Lions. Uh, the Buffalo Bills did something the Lions haven't done since 2016, and that was win back-to-back -back games inside of Ford Field. That's crazy. 
back-to-back games <laughs> inside of Ford Field. The Lions have not done that since 2016, and the Buffalo Bills did it on their first attempt. Like, they've only played two games there back-to-back ever, and they won both of them, and the, the Lions haven't done that since. So that, that, that shows a lot. Because, I mean, to put that in context, the Vikings every year win back-to-back games at home. So that is – that's sad. It's pretty sad, look, Detroit. Uh, but – Here's, here's how I'll pay off the tease. Here's something that fans did not think would happen on Thursday night because you brought that up. Prime time. Prime time. Everybody watching. The world is sitting at home, eating turkey, drinking liquor. Uh, we couldn't. We had to be sober and at work. But Kirk Cousins throws for over 300 yards. Now, yes, I know this, the stat line says 299. He threw a negative one towards the end. Uh, but... 200 basically 300 yards on prime time 300 yards on prime time i'm gonna say that again 300 yards on prime time three touchdowns not three garbage touchdowns three touchdowns in a in a in a game that mattered because people could say oh it was a blowout that's why kirk cousins did no it, it was a game that mattered it was a back and forth battle adam thielen justin jefferson tj Hawkinson finally gets his first touchdown and this is what I love about the, the Adam Thielen touchdown. If you watch Kirk Cousins, he has a read. He's he, Justin Jefferson has an over, and so does Adam Thielen. If that safety sits over the top of the underneath, runs with Adam, it's going to Justin. There's another two underneath guys. But the minute both guys ran with Justin, the third guy in the middle of the field kind of hesitated because he didn't just go that way. He just hesitated. Kirk knew I have to rifle this to the back of the end zone and put it to where only Adam can get it and the safety can't catch up. And that's what you saw. Like, I loved that about Kirk Cousins, that he was willing to throw a hard rocket knowing I got to get this by the safety. He read it perfectly. They couldn't read his eyes because he was looking at Justin Jefferson. Like, we know when Kevin O'Connell draws up plays, he's telling Kirk, hey, take, it out, take, take a look at 18 and then go through your progressions. And 18 mm-hmm. was triple covered pretty much. So he went to Adam Thielen. And, and I love that because in past, he might have like stared Justin Jefferson down, not had to throw, panicked a little bit when, when, when the pocket started to collapse. He's like, you know what? I'm going to sit in here a little bit longer and I'm going to throw this as hard as I can. And he did it. And that's the, Kirk, that's the Kirk Cousins that we all know he could be. But Kevin O'Connell is bringing, out, bringing it out of him. Here's another one when I look at these stats. 23 first downs. But the big difference, so last week, decent amount of first downs, but they were 1-11 for on third down last week. 1-11. for When they lost to the Cowboys, 1-11. for That is horrible. Yikes. My daughter, if I give her 11 times to do something, she's going to at least do it twice. And she's eight. She probably does it more, but I'll give her at least twice. 1-11 for on third down. Almost a goose egg on third down. This week, Eight for 15, over 50% third down conversions. And, and that's the key. And, and when, what, what, is, what does third down conversions do? It keeps you on the field. So then what happens? 36 minutes time of possession. 36 minutes. And this is Bill Belichick, the master of the clock, the maestro of the minutes. 23 minutes for Belichick. So not only was he out coached and Kevin O'Connell handled his business, they handled their business staying on the field, keeping their defense off the field. The defense, if you think about it, only went 23 minutes, which is also crazy to think they put up 400, uh, 400 yards of uh, total offense. But, hey, it was some big strikes, big throws. Uh, pressure wasn't always there, but the pressure got there when it needed mm-hmm. to. You saw some late quarterback pressure, some late sacks, and that's what this team is about. But now they're going to face a team in the Jets that that defense is scary. That's a scary defense. That that they have some they have some grown men, Quinton Williams, Mosley. You got a uh, Sauce Gardner on the corner. The kid's not giving up a lot. Again, shout out to Martin Luther King High School in Detroit. That's my school. That's my guy. I'm looking forward to him being in the building. Like I I I haven't seen him since he was a little little kid. He might have been like a friend. I have to go back and even look at the year. What what year that would have been? How old he would have been? He was he probably was not even then. He probably was a seventh grader you know, working out with the high school team because when my dad passed away, I went up to the high school with myself, uh, Larry Foote, Spice Adams, 
and uh, Kevin Vickerson, all of us played in the NFL, and they were doing a camp. Larry Foote had a camp going on at, at uh, up at the high school. And I went by there and then spoke to the kids, and I know Sauce Gardner was one of them. And was so, he called Sauce at that point? I don't know. I have to ask him that when I see him Sunday. I have to ask him that because I don't know when the Sauce happened. I just know because I talked to my high school coach in my high school, and they say he didn't even play. Like, he wasn't a guy until like his junior year. Like he didn't play until like nine games, basically the playoffs of his junior year. Yes, we'll get back to Sauce Gardner versus Justin Jefferson later this week, of course. Um, but my, my last takeaway, Sam, because the next segment I'm looking forward to, the best and the worst of the weekend. Because this was one of the few weekends, Sam, that I actually got to chill. And, and I'm pretty sure you, you felt that same feeling. Like waking up Sunday, just doing, I did a pregame show. We just did a pregame show, recap. Uh, just broke down some film. But then there was nothing else to do. Went to the gym, had a relaxing day. Got oh, to watch some football all day and all night. Uh, packed up the house. So there will be a new set uh, for the Ron Johnson show coming up. Probably, nah, I don't know what week. Probably next week after this. Uh, once we get settled in and, and get the cable and internet set up. Uh, be a new set. I'm looking forward to that. Having some morning coffee with you guys. But this is what I say about this game with the Jets and, and the Patriots game. We'll put this to bed. The Patriots are a good team. Let's not forget that. Like, they are not a bad team. They're a good team. Bill Belichick is a great coach. Kevin O'Connell is a rookie. That's normally what people say. Rookie coaches against Bill Belichick don't do well because of what he does. Kevin O'Connell said, you know what? I'm going to go back to what I do best. And I think that was the best thing for it. Justin Jefferson, I said this. Lions game, three catches. Saints game, 10 catches. What happened? Cowboys game, three catches. Patriots game, Nine. That's the prop bet. You guys could have took that on betonline.net. Take the prop. Is Justin Jefferson going to have over whatever catches? Yeah. Because Kevin O'Connell knows after one bad game, he's going to build on the next. And, and they showed it. But I loved how he got the offense started. We talked about that. Best coach out there in the best first 15 plays. I think in the third quarter, he needs to script another 15. Why not? Especially if you know you're getting the ball. Even if you're not getting the ball right away, script those next 15. Because you do a really good job of scripting plays. Um, whether you have to script them at halftime, you have to sit down real quick and think about it and say, here's the 15. Or you kind of have five to six different game plans in your pocket. And then you pull the one out that you think is going to work for what the game has been doing. Either way, this team, the sky's not falling. They're 9-2. and two. The way the playoff picture fits Sam, right now, when you look at the playoffs. Playoffs? Yeah, we got to talk about it because they're, they're in it. When you look at the playoffs, if the Vikings win and the Packers did lose already, so now they just need another Bears loss or Lions loss. Um, I know I say I think Bears out. I think it's Lions loss and another Packers loss. They're done because the Vikings will have 10 wins and none of those teams can get 10. So they will have the season locked up week 13. That's crazy as far as the NFC North goes. I don't see the Eagles like unless all hell breaks loose, the remaining yeah. race for the number one seed. Tennessee Titans, New York Giants, Dallas Cowboys, New Orleans Saints, New York Giants. And that's the Eagles. Can they lose to the Cowboys? Yes. Can they lose to the Bears? Well, the way the Packers handed them, yes. But that's only if Justin Fields is back because you will have two of the best running quarterbacks uh, in the mm -hmm. NFL. When you look at the Saints, so I don't think this is their year. They don't have it. Now, the Titans is an interesting one because the Eagles, like, you can run the ball on them when you watch last night the way the Packers did it. And Derrick Henry is really good. But Derrick Henry does not like to get hit early. And that's what the Eagles do. But what Aaron Jones and some of those guys were doing, they ran through that first little tackle, even though I forgot which, I think it was Aaron Jones, got his leg absolutely blown off. Or uh, the other one, I think it was 28, got his leg blown off. Like Dylan. They were scud missiles is what the Eagles were coming at the Packers with. But the Giants, Saquon Barkley twice. And so when you think about that with Saquon Barkley, in the NFC East, they can beat them twice. Like, they literally can beat them twice because Daniel Jones doesn't make mistakes, and he runs when he needs to. He's not, like, super fast or anything, but he can run when he needs to. Like, he can get going when he needs to. And so that's why – and, the and the, and of course, the Cowboys. Like, the Cowboys are, are really good. Cowboys are really good. And so you got the Giants and the Cowboys. Those three for sure are tough. And who knows? The Bears might help the Vikings out. So this race for the NFC is not over. You got the Jets for the Vikings, seems like a win. You got the Lions, seems like a win. You got the Colts, seems like a win. Giants, that's a tough one. 
running, 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 or uh, sorry, running quarterback with a running back that can run. Packers probably be facing Jordan Love, honestly. I think Aaron Rodgers is done for the mm-hmm. season. Like those ribs, that did not look good the way he was grimacing after every throw. And then you got the Bears at the end. Who knows what that's going to look like? It might not matter, but it might. The Vikings might not have lost. They might run the table and nine and two, and the Eagles are nine and or whatever in three, nine and two. What am I saying? Uh, 14 and two. <laughs> And the Eagles are 13 and three. It's going to matter. It might matter. This is one of those years where you're like, man, that January 8th game, the past couple of years, has it really mattered? As far as like, we don't have our own, like, we don't have control over it. It's like, we got to win, but then we need somebody else to lose. This is now, they might just win, beat the Bears and have that number one seed. And then we have a bye week in the first week. The Vikings have a bye and then they turn around and host the next two games hopefully if they win and they don't lose the first one but sam next segment like i said we got the uh best and worst of the weekend i'll give my thoughts you give yours we'll kind of go back and forth and debate about it got a really interesting pj fleck segment comment conversation we got to have in the next one as well um it, it it's it is what happens in college football this was a crazy weekend for that we'll talk about that kids decommitting uh, Gophers kids even leaving the program, entering the portal. The portal has over 1,500 kids in the portal right now. That's crazy. Over 1,500 kids in the portal. And that's going to affect high school kids. I, I hate to say it. I feel bad for the high school kids coming out because now you got coaches that are going to sit on 10 to 12 scholarships knowing they could reload in the portal. But, hey, check out our Locked On Sports Minnesota podcast on YouTube following every Twins. Vikings, Wild, or Wolves game. Our Locked On team hosts are broadcasting live with team insiders. Never miss a podcast by subscribing to Locked On Sports Minnesota on YouTube. We have a word from our sponsors. BetOnline.net, Ron, your number one source for sports betting info, stats, news, and analysis. Get the latest odds and trends for every professional and amateur league out there. Football, basketball, soccer, esports, they've got it all. Let's take a look at the early week line on Vikings Jets. The Vikings favored by three over under 44. In that one, Vikings money line minus 155. Get that line and plenty more at betonline.net on your laptop, desktop, or mobile device, wherever you can access it, betonline.net, where the game starts. Well, Sam, I'm excited about this segment. Uh, we get to have a little best and worst of the weekend. It could be anything, Sam. Uh, we're we're going to use this a little bit more. Uh, we might even use this with guests, like give them a heads up. Like, hey, we're going to do the best and the worst weekend with you. Uh, best and the worst of your weekend to start off our show. But the best and the worst of the weekend for me, Sam. And uh, I'll start off with my best, and then I'll let you give your best. My best of the weekend, and... For those that saw the open, I mean, come on now. I wore this for a reason. This here represents everything we worked for all season. The Gophers beat the Badgers. And it was so interesting. And even around the world is interesting. uh, Sorry, not around the world, around Minnesota. That I felt like the media was sitting on their stories. Like they were sitting on stories waiting waiting to kind of say oh this is a failed season uh we knew it seven and five you know get ready for you know the 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 whatever music not music city but the uh motor city bowl or whatever the little caesars i don't know what it is detroit at fort field blah 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 blah. everybody had something to say about something can't beat iowa when the iowa team's the worst they've ever been you know should have been a purdue team that's not that good well purdue's in the big 10 championship doesn't say a lot for the west but whatever they're going to play Michigan. I hope they beat Michigan, honestly, now so that people can be like, man, the Gophers lost to the Big Ten champion. Now I'm kind of rooting for it because I, 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 for, for bowl game purposes, I don't want Michigan to lose because I want Minnesota to get the best possible bowl because we know the Big Ten only has, what, six bowl games, I think is what they do, and then they have some at-large ones you can go to. Uh, but you don't want those bowls like, you know, the outback and some of those taken up by teams like Michigan that should be in the playoff. And Ohio, I, think, I, I hope Ohio State get back in there. I hope whatever it takes for Ohio State to get back in, and I think it has to be a convincing Michigan win over Purdue to show the committee how good Michigan really is. And then some of those other teams need to lose. But my best of the weekend, Sam, is the Gophers winning. Like, seeing that axe on the, on the bus. They took a bus back from Madison, by the way. 
uh, seeing the, bu- the the axe on the bus headed back to Minnesota, seeing all the sad Wisconsin. Like, Twitter was so quiet from Badger haters. Like, all week, all I heard was PJ Fleck this and blah, blah. You guys can't beat us and, you know, snake oil sales and blah, blah. And then after he wins, silence. Like, all those roll the boat memes or whatever Wisconsin was prepared to put out there and didn't happen. It was a peaceful weekend because I didn't have to deal with those guys. I didn't have to deal with that team in red. (laughs) I was so peaceful. And then when I look at Jim Leonard not getting the job, I realized that probably was part of it. Like, because all through the broadcast, when the the Badgers were up, they talked about, like, more than not, Jim Leonard is going to be introduced as the head coach next week. They're going to name him the head coach. Uh, They've already put it out, so they have to give seven days uh, of notice to the world before you can actually give them the job. Uh, so on and so forth. And, you know, this is just a preliminary, like they just have to do some interviews and, you know, he, he hasn't moved into the head coach's office yet because he, he's not really the head coach yet. So he's just waiting. He figured he'd stay in his DC. I mean, it was Jim Leonard, Jim Leonard, Jim Leonard. Wake up, Luke Fickle. <laughs> and when the first report came out, uh, I have to say it, like one of the recruits, I know the kid, he's from Michigan. I'm hoping he picks Minnesota now. Amari uh, Snowden, 6'4", safety, Sauce Gardner type kid, he tweeted, ain't no way, ain't no way. Coach loves us too much. Does he? Does he now? That's why I tweeted, kids go to schools for coaches. The city matters, school probably matters, program, but at the end of the day, they go to school for coaches. Coaches don't coach for kids. They coach for their next job. They're coaching for their culture for their job security. So that's why that whole weekend was injured, but that was the best of the weekend for me. Seeing like literally the dominoes fall from the Gophers winning to the Badgers now, like scrambling to find a new coach. What what was your best of the weekend, Sam? Best of the weekend. Uh, Watched a lot of red zone yesterday, trying to track the NFL. I saw two teams have the cojones down by one in the final 15 seconds of the game go for two for the win and come through. The Jaguars did it to beat the Ravens. That's a big upset win. And it's easier to do when you have nothing to lose. I mean, when you're the Jaguars, you're not going anywhere. Yeah, you can do that kind of thing. But then the Chargers in Arizona on the road, uh, they score in the final seconds. They go for two. They get it and maybe keep their season alive. Six and five is a lot different than five and six, and they get a win against the uh, the hapless Arizona Cardinals. I think Cl- Cliff Kingsbury is in some trouble there, um, but that's a pretty a pretty bold move on a couple of coaches' parts that paid off. That was a lot of fun to watch for me. Um, and I, I was going to ask you in the daily three, maybe we hold on to this, how you would feel about the Vikings making that decision. But but let's let's save that for later okay. in the show. I like it. I like it. Yeah, no, I, I definitely watch those. And it's funny, too, watching Justin T- Tucker line up for a 67-yard field goal. Oh, I thought it was good. I thought, I thought he was, was going to make too. it. That's what's so <laughs> funny is everybody thought it was good. Like, it was heading there. Even the referees, like, you could see them kind of go like, oh, wait, what? He missed that. Oh, because they looked at each other like, that was short, right? Yep. Okay. No good. Like, that's how how much confidence the world has in Justin Tucker. I don't think Vikings fans would have had faith with a 20-yard field goal at that point uh, because of what the field goal situation has been in Minnesota since 1998. Like, it's just like Vikings fans and field goals, Blair Walsh, you know, Pete Burch has made a joke to me this weekend. Um, He blamed, you know, it was TCF Bank Stadium back then, uh, the loss of the Seahawks in the cold, and saying that it's a chance the Vikings could host the Seahawks again here. Um, So hopefully, maybe. Kevin O'Connell, Greg Joseph gets redemption uh, for Ghosts of Pass. You know, he gets to beat the Seahawks in the U.S. Bank Stadium. Uh, hopefully not a field goal, though. Let's not let's not do that. Let's let's just like, no, let's not do that. Uh, my worst of the weekend, Sam. Mm-hmm. My worst of the weekend starts with a video. We'll listen to that here. I still remember people, Heather and I, every time they'd see us, just beat Wisconsin. You can stay forever. Just beat Wisconsin. You can stay forever. Beat Wisconsin. Stay forever. We beat Wisconsin twice, and you all wanted me fired last week. So, and how that goes. Yeah. That's what he was hired to do. It's not just beat Wisconsin, though. He's hired to beat everybody. But here's the thing about college coaching. Social media has made 
people way too accessible. Like in the past, when coaches lost, the only real feedback they got was face-to-face and then the mainstream media. And it's easy to ignore the mainstream media if you don't read the paper. But this little device here, this, this thing here, Coaches can see, even though they act like they don't see, they see because they have to see it because they're getting text messages and they're checking their texts. And then somebody, hey, did you see this tweet? Did you see this? And the biggest, biggest, biggest problem I have now is the blue check mark. So some of these people are tweeting from blue check marks and they paid $8 for it. And so it feels like it's more like reputable media, nothing against people that pay for the blue check mark. Or it feels like it's an important person. It really had like it matters and it does it. And so I think that's what's getting going on right now is there's a lot of loud voices. The squeaky wheel gets the oil and the squeaky wheel was the people, the, the small few people that say we want PJ Fleck fire. I don't think anybody really said that. I didn't see it. Um, so that's my worst of the weekend because I just hate that. Like, like after a big win like that, you can tell he was mentally tired. Like that was tired. That's a tired response that's I'm tired it's been a long season yep I know I didn't beat Iowa I get it I know I should have been in the Big Ten Championship I hear it I know this we had a weak strength of schedule so on and so forth I know we haven't beaten a team uh with a winning record all this all that all that all that jazz everything that's been said that I mean he's only human that's what that was a human response you guys wanted human responses that was a human response because when he gives canned answers you know, roll the boat, sky, you might go gophers. Everybody's like, oh, here we go again. Here's all these PJ Fleckisms. But then when he gives you like an actual, like, this is what I'm feeling, man. Like, I'm just tired. Here's what I feel. Everybody wants to know, oh, really? Like, nobody wanted you fight. Like, the man is just opening up a vein. In that moment, he was vulnerable. He was tired. So that was my worst of the weekend because I just feel like I, I hope, I hope he gets refreshed. This is a break now. He gets to recruit. Um, there's going to be a lot of co- co- uh, players in the portal uh, due to, like like I said, look at Cincinnati. Cincinnati, I think, has four or five kids now decommitted and then three or four transferring. So there's a lot of kids in the portal from some good schools. And then there's also schools that, mm-hmm. you know, kids just, you know, thought they should be playing and aren't playing. Don't get along with the coach. Their coach left. Who knows what? PJ also had a couple guys leave, but nothing, nothing major. We were like, oh, okay, I can't believe this guy transferred. Like, not, nothing that you can't just go out there and say, this guy wasn't even a starter. So, none of that. Cincinnati actually lost, uh, losing, I don't know, one starter for sure. Um, but I don't know. I mean, again, this is early. This is just Monday. <laughs> this is Monday. And and these kids can decommit and, and do all their stuff all the way through, I think, like, December, January, February. Because the early signing period, period is, like, December something, and then you got January, February signing period. So, this is going to be a wacky offseason. Uh, but I just hope PJ gets refreshed because that, to me, I, I wasn't happy with that. He looked he looked just tired and, and annoyed, mm-hmm. to say the least. And uh, we all back him. I uh, know a lot of the alumni, it's kind of, it's torn. You know, some people are on that bandwagon of like, hey, we, we should be doing. We've all been there. We've had seasons. We were, I think we were like 6-0 and after beating Ohio State. And everybody said, we're going to the Rose Bowl. We even had shirts made. Our coaches one of our strength coaches had a shirt made with a rose on it to work out in the weight room the rest of the season. And then we turned around and lost to Indiana. So it happens. Like you beat Penn State, Ohio State, and then you lose to Indiana. That's what college football is about. Look at Tennessee. Look at Alabama. Look at LSU. It happens. You lose to teams you shouldn't lose to. That's why you play the game. That's why the 18 and 0 Patriots didn't win the Super Bowl. Play the game. This is what football's about. This is what sports is about. But what was your worst of the weekend, Sam? Worst of the weekend. Not a lot of people paid attention to this because it was a football Sunday. Um, the Wild were also on, so people were were kind of split with their attention. But the Wolves played yesterday. Steph Curry t- came to town. The Warriors came to town, mm-hmm. and they hung 47 points on the Wolves. In the first quarter. Back in the 90s, that was a half. You'd have 47 at halftime and you'd be pretty happy. Yeah. They hung 47 in the first quarter. And the Wolves lost that game by 23 points. Um, the five game winning streak they had already feels pretty distant now because they lost to Charlotte, 
They lost now to the Warriors, and they're back to 500 on the season. But Gobert was brought in for defense, Ron. You can't give up 47 points in a quarter when you're like one of your highest paid players is this defensive wizard. That's not acceptable. That was my worst of the weekend. Yeah, I watched a clip um, before we jump into the Daily Three. I watched a clip of Rudy Gobert. I think Carl Anthony Towns went to the hole, lost the ball. Rudy Gobert gets it. He tries to go to the hole, and he loses the ball. Like, And somebody said, like, the Jazz got over on the on the Timberwolves. Maybe. Because uh, I feel like uh, we were sold a bill of goods. It's not good. And it doesn't work. And the West went small. Uh, the East went small. Like, I get it. You wanted the Twin Towers. You thought it was going to work. You're not running plays for Twin Towers. You're not doing Twin Towers type play. Carl Anthony Towns should not be dribbling the ball going to the hole. Like, the point of two bigs is to clear space for your little guys and be able to dish it to a big. Not the big to draw the dribble and lose the ball. Like, if Carl Anthony Towns wants to dribble, you don't need another big. You need four other guys to spread the floor out so he can be one-on-one. -on -one. Rudy Gobert standing in the hole while Carl Anthony Towns dribbles to the hole is insane. It literally is insane. Like, even in pickup basketball, I tell guys that. If I'm coming to the lane, get out the lane. Don't stand there because when I go, if I feel guys crash, then I know I have an easy kick out. Like, it's simple basketball. And I just don't know what's going on. If Cat it doesn't want to listen, maybe, because he shouldn't be driving to the lane with Rudy Gobert in the lane, I don't know. I don't know what their offense is. I don't get it. If I have two mm -hmm. bigs, I'm playing the high-low. I'm putting Cat at the at the, at the the uh, free throw line, and I'm putting Rudy Gobert under the basket, going back and forth under the basket. Cat, you get at the top. You make a move. If you can pull up and shoot the jumper from the free throw line, shoot it. If you can make a one move and go, go. If you can wait, make one move and then dish it, or if you dish it down – because now he's singled up underneath the basket. You now can make the over-the-top pass. But, like, getting it from the three-point line and then trying to create, like, you're some, like, because you want to be a wizard of a big, I just don't – I don't get it. Like, he is – he could be one of the best players in the league. And so I don't know if that's him or if that's coaching, but something has to change. It has to because – with that team, it seems pretty simple with Anthony Edwards being as good as he is. It seems simple, uh, but you also got to hit threes, and the Warriors showed you that. Like, there's not going to ever be another Steph Curry for a while. Like, him and Clay is something magic. But we got the Daily Three coming up. Looking forward to this one with Sam because we're going we're gonna to jump into some Vikings talk and some what-ifs. But remember, when you subscribe to Locked On Sports Minnesota, you're getting endless Vikings talk with local experts. Subscribe to the free Locked On Sports Minnesota podcast feed wherever you find your podcast, and you can find all of our videos on the Locked On Sports Minnesota's YouTube channel. And Sam has another word for you. Thanks for making the Ron Johnson Show your first listen today. And for your second listen, check out Locked On Sports Today. From the games that matter the most to the biggest stories in sports, Go beyond the scoreboard and behind the scenes with local experts and insights only Locked On can provide. Locked On Sports Today, available on this app, YouTube, and wherever you get your podcasts. I teased this up a moment ago. Let's pay it off now. A couple teams went for two yesterday to win the game. Ron, mm -hmm. put on your coach headset if you're Kevin O'Connell <laughs> and the Vikings are in that position with just seconds remaining, would you want him to go for two? Uh, in that situation, yeah. Uh, when you look at TJ Hawkinson, Adam Thielen, Justin Jefferson, you look at some of the goal line play calls he's done, some of the pass plays he's done. Uh, Brandon Staley, for instance, with the Chargers, I really like that play design. Uh, Dan Orlovsky drew it up, and he tried to make it sound more uh, – like, I get it. It's his job. He has to talk through and give us all the back stuff and blah, blah, and people are listening. It's a simple t tight end follow route. Like, I don't know why he's making it out to be some innovative thing. Like, unless the Lions – and he did play for the Lions, so maybe it is innovative to him. But that's just tight end follow. That route has been around for a while for, for a lot of teams. Uh, the follow route is just the first guy runs a slant or crosser, and the second guy follows him. That's all that was. That literally was tight end follow from the inside or Y. Like if you put the Y inside, you call it Y follow. So the Y knows if I have the follow route, I have to get outside. So if you start inside, then you widen and then you run the follow. Because he didn't run a slant. He just kind of followed him up the field. And what you're hoping for is that the first guy goes 
even if the other guy looks and knows it's coming, he doesn't have enough time to turn. And it's not one of those like, you know, jailbreak type things. And then what, what most people think is when you have a first crosser here and another guy widens, you assume that second guy widening is going to try to go to the flat. And that's all he was playing for. And that's why they running backs call it the Texas route. When they do it, it's the same thing as running back. Follow, they're following a guy clearing uh, sometimes, but it's tight end follow. And I, I love it. So I think Kevin O'Connor has a lot of plays. Uh, so, yes, I would have I would be OK with them going for two there. What about you? Yeah, well, you're right. O'Connell in the low red zone has been unbelievable. Like, the, the stuff that he draws up from the one-yard line, other than the QB sneak in Buffalo, I know that wasn't, <laughs> that wasn't as creative, maybe, but uh, he's been really good, like, first, second, and goal at the two-yard line. That, that's his best play-calling work that he's done all season. So, yeah, I think he should from that standpoint. But I just think it's a smart move from a game theory standpoint as well because if you accept the tie well first of all you could miss the extra point and vikings fans have seen greg joseph he misses a lot of extra points so that's one number two there's no guarantee you win the coin toss in overtime you might not get the ball back um if you can can run a play that is what 75 percent success if you have kevin o'connell's play calling sheet i think that's definitely the better win probability um to go forward in that moment so if you miss it you know, you get crucified in the media. If you make it, you're a genius. It's a big risk, and it's a big gamble to take, and you have to be super secure in yourself as a coach. But I think it's the right move. Yeah. I agree. All right. What you got next? Yeah. Uh, we talked about the Wolves a little bit. They are now 10-10 and 10 on the year, basically a quarter of the way through the season, Ron. So mm-hmm. are you changing your prediction? Because you were, you were saying Wolves are a top-four seed in the West, home playoff round in the first round. Uh, or home court advantage, I should say. Are you adapting your prediction now after this slow start? Yeah, I thought about this one. I saw that question coming a mile away. Yeah, I'm willing to admit I was wrong. I was wrong. I, I was wrong. My wife would love to see me say that to her all the time. I was wrong. Um, I assumed that this would be a uh, Orlando, or not, sorry, uh, Houston Rockets type, Olajuwon, you know, uh, Ralph Sampson or uh, David, uh, Robinson and uh, Tim Duncan. Nope. Not even Duncan Hines right now. Uh, that's the problem. So when you look at the West and then you look at the East, 10 and 10 even in the East, because a lot of people always try to say that, like, oh, the East, like that used to be back in the day. The East is a cupcake. Like that's why LeBron's running through the East and blah, blah. If you were 10 and 10 in the East, you'd be the AFC. So it's pretty even right now. Like, they have a really good team in the Celtics at 16 and 4. They have a Bucks team that's 14 and 5. They have a Cavs, Cavs team without LeBron. That's crazy. LeBron might want to go back to the Cavs now. He might. LeBron should go back to the Cavs. He like, would jump at the chance. Coming yeah. up. Trade deadline is coming up. Hey, let's, I want to go back to the land. I want Bronny to be able to, like, the Cavaliers probably would pick up Bronny. I don't think the Lakers would. I think the Cavs would do it just for daddy. Uh, 13 and 7. Kevin Love and him can reunite. Uh, hey, go back to the Cavs. They probably wouldn't, it wouldn't take much to trade for LeBron at this point either. You got the Patriots at, or Patriots, Pacers at 11 and 8. You go to the West at 10 and 10, which is crazy. The Warriors are ninth. They're the 10th seed. So even at this point, having to play a play in for the Warriors, like, uh, you're not getting in. You're not even getting in the playoffs right now because you're not going to beat the Warriors. You're not going to beat the Jazz, which imagine that. Like the Jazz at one point, Early, remember, they were number one. Right. Like, they were top three. So, I think they got the tank message. Like, hey, hell are y'all doing? You're supposed to be tanking. Why are y'all winning? Throw the ball out of bounds. Change it up. <laughs> but but the Jazz are back down to eight. So, no, they're not going to be four. I do think they'll get in the playoffs because I think the Jazz literally don't want to be in the playoffs. Like, I think they want the best possible draft pick they can get with all the pieces they're going to get from the Timberwolves. And if they can get a double-edged sword, because I haven't looked at the whole package, but if the Timberwolves pick goes to them too, I know they're like, man, if we could suck and they could suck, that's the best thing we could ask for. Because <laughs> they, maybe they could package it. I don't know if anybody would be willing to make that trade to give them the best player in the draft. Because uh, there are two top ones coming out, though. So who knows? But no, they're not going to be a top four team. They're, they're, they're going to be a play-in team. I hate to say it as of now. Mm-hmm. I don't see the next 60 games getting better. Um, they're a play-in team. I don't know. What do you think? 
the West is kind of lumped together right now. I mean, that that's the one hope is that no one's really pulling away from the pack in the West. There's a lot of teams kind of around that 500 mark or just a little above the 500 mark. You know, 20 games in, it does leave you a lot of time to figure things out. But, I mean, what happens, Ron, if they get injuries? They've been healthy. Right. I mean, they've had, they've had their guys. They've had the full complement of players, and they're not winning now. What happens when they get a guy banged up? What if they lose Edwards for a couple of weeks? What if they lose Cat for a couple of weeks? So accounting for that, I don't think they're going to be a top four seed. And I'm kind of I'm I'm accepting the reality that they're going to be in the playing round again, and it's not going to feel nearly as fun as it did last year. It'll be more of a of a grind, like getting teeth pulled if you have to go through that just to get in the playoffs. No, not fun. Yeah, I got one more yeah. question for you, Vikings. In the current NFC playoff outlook, they would be the two seed, and they would be playing the number mm-hmm. seven seed Washington Commanders at U.S. Bank Stadium. If the playoffs yep. started today, Ron, how do you like that matchup? I like it. I like the matchup. I mean, we already saw, like, the, I'm, I'm pretty sure the referee in U.S. Bank Stadium is not going to get in the way of Cam uh, Bynum. Uh, I, I like it. I like that matchup. That's a very favorable matchup for the Vikings. Um, Commanders are a good team, though. Let's, let's, not be, let's be for real. Taylor Heineke down the stretch is going to get better and better. But I do think Taylor Heineke's never dealt with being in U.S. Bank Stadium. Like, I think the nerves of like, oh, man, I'm back to where I should have been in the first place if I hadn't kicked through the glass. All that emotion, like, that would be a lot. And uh, I, I do, I truly believe Kirk Cousins knocking his old team out of the playoffs, too, that would be even sweeter for him. So I, I do like that matchup. You also have the Cowboys having to travel to the Bucks. Playoff Brady is a different beast. Playoff Brady. So now all of a sudden, Cowboys are out. You got Brady walking around now knocking people down. And then who knows what happens with the Giants Seahawks. Like, it's like, there's a thing. I mean, other than the Eagles, I guess the Cowboys, because they did shellac the Vikings. But other than the Eagles, it's this NFC championship, you don't, I mean, you don't really know who's gonna get there because there's so many teams that head to head are better matchups. Like I like the Bucks versus the Cowboys and I like the Vikings versus the Cowboys. I think the Bucks are built better to handle what the Cowboys do. Tom Brady is the master of the quick game. He doesn't want to get hit. He doesn't want to run. He's going to figure out ways to get the ball out of his hands super quick. So I think that fits beating a Cowboys team. What Tom Brady does. So no, I like it. I like I like the I like the uh, Vikings commanders. I think that's the matchup that Hey, that's not say a guarantee win, but you can be very confident that you can win that game at home. I don't know. I mean, do you do you see a better matchup? So other than the Seahawks, I guess, do you see a better matchup over there? I mean, honestly, the Seahawks scare me more than than Washington. I mean, Geno Smith's been playing well. Kenny Walker is one of the most exciting young players in the game. DK Metcalf, an improving defense. Uh, I know they lost yesterday. They gave up 40 points, so maybe they'll fade down the stretch, but – Washington does not scare me. I mean, Heineke does not scare me as a quarterback, especially on the road. Their defense is tough, but the Vikings have also made some very good defenses look very bad. I mean, the the Cowboys game being the obvious exception, they hung 33 Mm -hmm. on the Bills and 33 on the Patriots. Those are good defenses. Um, So I, I would love to play Washington and then roll the dice and try to, you know, get Dallas knocked out by Tampa and, and see what, what happens. But you know, I wouldn't want to play San Francisco. I wouldn't want to play um, Dallas again if they fell down to the seventh seed. So I, I think Washington's the best scenario there. Yeah, I agree. I, I think Washington, the way it, it's set up, yeah, the the Forty Niners, it's a scary one too. <laughs> like mm-hmm. that team looks good now. They look really good now. Jimmy Garoppolo's got to go. Did you see that stat about Jimmy Garoppolo? By the way, we'll talk about this tomorrow. Maybe uh, I know we. we Little tease, Chris Carter, Vikings Hall of Famer. Uh, so maybe we'll get his take on quarterbacks in the NFL. But Jimmy Garoppolo, his stats, win loss, it's up there with uh, Steve Young and like Joe Montana or something. Like I saw him, he's like forty and nineteen. I'm like, he's the most disrespected good quarterback I've ever seen in my life. Like he's so disrespected. But 
another topic for another show because I can go on forever about that. If you want endless Vikings talk, make sure you subscribe to Locked On Sports Minnesota on YouTube where you can find all of our videos, all of our shows, instant podcasts after every game, and the Vikings press conference delivering all the biggest news. Like our videos and leave your comments in the section below. Let us know what you think. Is the Washington Commanders the team you want to see in the playoffs in the first round? Or is there another team that you'd rather face to get them out the way? Also, the number two seed. Is it the Vikings to have? Or is there a chance the 49ers can creep in and knock them out of that number two spot? Let us know. Comment, like, share below. Have a great day.